Today, folks, um, you're in for a treat. By far, this is my most requested talk, my high impact, high engaging talk, maximizing your potential. So what is my theme and my thought for today? I want you to really sit back and think about this as I'm going through this presentation. Let your mind meditate upon this one thought. Understand the value that you bring to this organization. Understand the value that you bring to the workplace. Understand the value you bring to your home, to your community. Because we'll not only talk about how to maximize your potential work, we'll talk to you about how to reach the people across the planet. It all starts here. So my mentor would often say, Milton, you have to change your attitude. You have to change the way you think about things. You have to see things different. So Ken, I like to ask the question. When life gives you lemons, what are we supposed to do, Ken? Last I checked, you're supposed to drink water, right? Or make lemonade. How about that? Make lemonade. Actually, my mentor told me, if you change the way you think, and when life gives you lemons, if you pick the seeds out of them and plant them, you can grow an orchard so you can take care of yourself and others for the rest of their lives. He was methodical about my attitude and changing the way I think. Does anybody on this training today know the, mo the two most important days of your life? The two most important days of your life. And I'm going to give you a tip. One of them is not the day you die because that's when it's over. And yes, one of them is the day you're born. So does anybody know what that second day is? The most important day of your life. The day that you help someone else. Okay. How about this? Mine happened on December the 7th of 1989. It was the day that I discovered my purpose and passion for living. It was the day that I understood why I was placed upon this earth. It was the day I understood that my greatest achievement was how I left the world and not what I did while I was in the world. That I had to leave this place better than I found it. I had a positive impact upon people's lives. So the two most important days are the day you're born and the day you discover your purpose and passion for living. Because then you can go into fulfillment. Folks, I should submit to you that as we talk about this shortly, you'll see the power of discovering your purpose. But back to attitude. So my mentor had a saying that kind of went like this. He said, nothing can stop the man that has the right mental attitude for achieving everything he wants in life. But nothing can help the man with the wrong mental attitude. And he said, Milton, you must change the way you think. I pondered that thought and at age 60, looking back at our 40 years together, here was the most difficult thing. Think about this. While the learning curve of life had taken me to the station I was at, it was the unlearning of the things that I had been taught, learned, seen, and heard that I never got to that kept me trapped in the body that I was in and never allowed me to go and do great things. It wasn't until I changed the way that I think. It wasn't until my perception changed, the way I looked at things. Is the glass half empty or is the glass half full? Well, some of you have said it's half full. My mentor would say, Milton, the glass is running over. Hold your feet up. They're about to get wet. See abundance. See what you can do. Don't see where you're at. I see you as you can become, not as you are. And it was this laboratory of life that my mentor, Dr. Preston Bruce, spent this 40 years developing my mind. That's all he wanted to do was develop my mind. And he helped me become a better man. He taught me how to be a better father. He taught me how to be a better community leader. He taught me how to be a better leader in business and industry. I was so fortunate, folks, to have Dr. Bruce come past my life. But let me start by talking to you about the three types of employees that we encounter. And as leaders on this call, these are the people that you're trying to motivate, encourage to be the best they can be. You want them to maximize your potential. Well, let me just run through this real quick. The first group is what we call the engaged worker. They work with purpose, work with passion. They get the job done. They're accountable, dependable. Some, some statistics say they represent about 30% of the workforce. These are the people that are backbone of the organization. Matter of fact, you probably are one of those engaged workers right now that I'm talking to. You know what it's like to be the person, the go-to person. They get the job done. They're accountable, dependable. You don't micromanage them. You lead them. You don't manage them. The second group is what I call the not engaged in workers, the not engaged workers. And folks, stay with me on this one. They are essentially putting in time, but no energy, no passion in everything they do. 
And then that spills over to their personal lives. They're getting ready to get ready and they've always been getting ready, but they never got anything done. They live by the three C's of criticizing, complaining, and condemning. Here's a sure sign that you've encountered one of these not engaged workers. You might walk into the office one day and say, how you doing? And don't miss this. This is a dead giveaway. How you doing? And they repeat this phrase that drives me absolutely crazy. How you doing? Hanging in there. Hanging in there? Well, I hope you're holding on tight. Because you only got to do this for 40 years. You only have 168 hours a week that you spend 65% of your life at this thing called work. But I understand because I was not an engaged worker in my first two jobs that I got fired from. I was there for the money. I was there for all the wrong reasons. I didn't really care about the job. I didn't care about the people as long as I got my check every other Friday. It wasn't until I discovered that there was so much more I could become. But yes, Dr. Bruce helped me with that. And this third group, and by the way, before I move to the third group, I should submit to you that some say that's about 60 50 to 60 percent of the workforce. I don't know. It could be higher. Sometimes it's lower depending upon the industry. If you talk to firefighters or people that have gone to school for a profession or you talk to people that have had this dream to have this job their whole life, the numbers are higher. But when you find people that have maybe just stumbled into a job or they just got this job because they needed one, they don't always find themselves engaged. I teach a whole course on how to motivate employees, how to get to the root of what it is that they want. Because remember, people don't come to work for you. They come to work for themselves. But the third group, the most amazing group, they actively disengage. They're just not unhappy at work. They're unhappy in life. And we pay the price every day when they come in. How can we maximize our potential when they're doom and gloom? They walk in, it's like a dark cloud comes by. I should submit to you that a lot of these folks have been just wandering through life, aimlessly going about there every day. No direction, no purpose. So some say that's about 20, 10 to 20%, depending upon who you talk to. But here's what I do know. We can help people become the best they possibly can be. Meslow said in, his, in, his, in the hierarchy of needs, he said, if you help people get to the pinnacle of self-actualization, where well, they have really bought into their own self-image, and I'm going to talk about all this in just a second, man, they can become the best that they can be. So don't forget those three types of employees when you're encountering. So what are my seven master keys to maximize your potential I'm going to talk about? There they are on the screen. Purpose, relationships. Wait till I cover that one. Self-image. I'm going to talk about mine. You sit back and relax. Fortitude, the ability to overcome obstacles, self-discipline, the things that we need to discipline in our lives, a life plan, a plan for success. And yes, I'll wind down by talking about attitude. Folks, I should submit to you that a lot of folks find their purpose and passion outside of work. It's not always what they do for a living. They enjoy the volunteering. They enjoy the community work. They enjoy feeding the homeless, taking care of animals, working in their synagogues, their churches, their mosques, wherever it is that they're involved in. They have a lot of religious beliefs that maybe drive them to a purpose and passion. But a person living with purpose and passion gets far more done and lives far more a productive life. I often ask myself this question. From 1960 to 1989 was 30 years roughly short of 30 years, a couple days. I often ask myself, where would I have been if Dr. Bruce hadn't come by? But here's the thing you got to know. He came by when, he was, when I was 18 years old. So for 12 years, he drilled this stuff into my head. And I'll share with you why it took so long for it to penetrate, to take root, if you will. Because I hadn't had people in my life talking about purpose. My mother and father were hardworking people. Their purpose was to put food on the table. Their purpose was to make sure the lights were on. I remember asking my father, do you love me? And he looked me right in the eye and said, the lights are on, aren't they? You got food in the refrigerator. It's clothes on your back. But I didn't understand. Was that his purpose? How would I discover mine? You can't be a wandering generality here. You really need to sit down. Here's an indicator that you've discovered your purpose. The first thing is it will give you tremendous amounts of joy. And there's a big difference between joy and happiness. Don't miss that. It will give you a lot of joy. 
The second thing is people will benefit from what it is that you provide and that you do, that they will be inspired and moved because of you in a lot of different ways, some you will never know. And the third thing is, it will bring you so much joy that you will be asked to do this thing repetitiously. And maybe you'll do it for other companies, other organizations. Maybe you'll do it throughout your organization in different locations. Maybe, just maybe, you'll go on to write a book about it. Maybe you're going to have a television show, a podcast. I don't know. But it will give you so much joy that you must get it out of you. The most important thing I can tell you is you will not die with it inside of you. You must give it away. That's when you know you've discovered your purpose. Folks, the pandemic forced me to a place where I had to reinvent, rediscover myself. How can I give my purpose and my passion away if I can't get in front of people? Man, I had to look into this camera and visualize thousands of people just like the audience I've spoke to for the last 30 years and I had to see them and believe it. Only to look at screens that people had no camera on. Nothing. And I'm wondering, who's really there? Man, our purpose will drive us to places we've never been before and take us to places we've never dreamed we could go. I, I implore you today to get a legal pad before the sun goes down. Maybe it's easier for you to figure out what you don't want to do in life than it is to figure out what you want to do in life. But I'm pleading with you. Identify and discover your purpose. Number two. Dr. Bruce said, Milton, you must have meaningful relationships. And he would often share with me the three most important relationships that I had to have. He said, the first relationship you must have is with yourself. He said, you have to like you. He said, if you want to maximize your potential to go on and do the greatest things beyond your wildest imagination, you got to like you first. He said, so here's a simple old test I implore you to do every day. When you get up in the morning and you're brushing your teeth, look in that mirror right before you start, ask yourself this most important question. Milton, do you like you? And look yourself right in the eye and be honest. Folks, I got to tell you, there was a lot of days I looked in that mirror. I didn't like that guy. Yeah, he suffered from drugs, alcoholism, incarceration. You know, growing up in Southeast Baltimore and in, in, in what we'll call the hood was a real tough place for me in the 70s. Mm. Real tough. But I was fortunate. I had some people in my life that poured into my life. The second relationship, he said, is critical that you must have. Critical is you must be in relationship with your significant other, your spouse, your pet, your partner, whatever it is you have at home that you spend quality time with. Because if you're not in congruency with that, you're going to be out of congruency in your life. Wow, that was a tough one for me to understand. Why did he drop that one on me? I had to be in a relationship. I watched my father and how he conducted his relationships. I thought, wow, this, this looks like it's working for them. Little did I know they were tolerating each other. They weren't accepting of each other. There's a tip for some of you. You'll figure that out later. But Dr. Bruce taught me how to love. He taught me how to have compassion. He taught me how to care. He taught me how to be in a meaningful relationship. And the third relationship, he said, is critical to your success, is you must be in relationship with the people that you spend 65% of your life with, the people at work. You don't have to love them, but you have to have a mutual working relationship. And then he would always say this, your net worth, and he didn't always talk about money. He talked about my self net worth, my mental net worth, my heart's net worth. He said, your net worth will be a sum total of your net worth. When you grow outside of your comfort zone, your relationships will grow. Folks, we have to be working together with other people all the time. I'm sure right now this isolation of the pandemic is driving people crazy. They can't wait to get back to work. To see those people that maybe just a little while ago, they couldn't stand them. But now they can't wait to see them. Because they're ready to leave the confines of their home. Folks, you have to be in relationship with something. If you're going to go on to do great things. The third point that he shared with me is self-image. And man, I need you just to sit back and let me talk about mine. You just relax. This is where I struggle the most. 
Yeah, Native Americans represent 2% of the population of the entire United States. 78% of all Native Americans live off reservation, while 22% live on reservation. In Baltimore City, where I grew up, we were less than 1%. And in my high school of 600 people, there was four Native Americans. Me, Kenny, Regina, and some boy that checked the box he knew he was an Indian. And I was challenged every day. What color are you? Are you black? Are you white? Are you a half-breed? Are you this? Are you that? And all day long, the questions came. And it challenged my self-image. I tried to fit in. I tried to belong. I tried to be a part of. Only moving away from the center of who I really was inside of me. A lot of folks think self-image is what you think I think you think about me. That's not self-image. Self-image is what I think about myself. And these six inches right here, if I don't get it right about myself, then I'll pay the price for the rest of my life. So as a chameleon growing up, trying to fit in, trying to understand, self-image is challenged. Garbage in, garbage out. No doubt, the greatest struggle was between my ears at six inches. How I view myself, I just wanted to be accepted. I just wanted to belong, only to discover I was worthy. Please don't miss this. I was worthy and accepting of it the whole time. I just didn't give it to myself. You must, if you want to maximize your potential, work on your self-image. I'm not talking directly to anybody. I'm just sharing openly. Your self-image will keep you trapped in a body that you don't want to be in, and it'll hold you longer than you want to stay. I encourage you to work on that. Build your inner man, your mind, your heart, your emotions, your will. Build that and you'll become the best that you can be. The next thing Dr. Bruce would always talk about is fortitude. He said, Milton, life is going to come by and sit on your steps at the most unopportune time. And folks, if I, would, if I could be close to you and see your face, I might see the pain in your eyes of the, of the struggles you've had to overcome. Whether that be health, whether that be something to do with divorce, relationships, whether that be job loss, whether that be family, friends, you've had to overcome some struggles and some things have been placed upon your path of life. And the question is, will you overcome them? Booker T. Washington said it the best. He said, show me a man that has overcome, and I'll show you a man that is going to become. Success is not to be measured by what I've achieved in life, but the obstacles that I've had to overcome. Are you maximizing your potential as the individual that you were placed upon this earth to be? Are you being the best you can be? Folks, you're going to have to overcome struggles. I remember Dr. Bruce said there's three things that happen to people that are hardest for them to ever overcome. He said, you be careful. You be most careful that if any of these three ever come your way, that you remember my voice and let it lead and guide you from a place of pain over the obstacles of life. Here are the three things. Death. When I lost my mother, it was so difficult. I'm the only child. Man, I remember she came from Robeson County in 1958. And they tell the story of how they were here and how she migrated from the South. And I would go back and to what we call the home place in Pembroke. And I would spend time with my family. I would walk the lands. I would, I would pick cucumbers and tomatoes like my mother did. And, and then I, I tried to do this thing called putting tobacco. And I tried to do everything. I wanted to connect. And she was very, very special to me. The guilt of everything I'd ever said, seen, and done with her, hurt, hurt. I had to overcome that. I had to forgive myself. Man, I hope I'm talking to somebody right now. I hope this is resonating with you to be the best that you can be. You gotta face these, these giants and you gotta slay them in your life. The second thing he said, is, man, if something health happens to you, he said, like the loss of a limb, heart attack, some major setback, feel like, Ken, I need to share this. I'm a motivational speaker. I speak in three continents to 15, 20 countries. 
25,000 to 30,000 pe people a year get to hear my voice. In 2007, I suffered depression and was institutionalized and hospitalized because the challenges of life had weighed upon my shoulders so great that I couldn't, I couldn't see my way through it anymore. And I remember Dr. Bruce visiting me and looking at me and saying, this is the moment of truth. This is when we will find out what you're really made out of. I believe in you. I see you as you're going to overcome this. Folks, you've had some struggles happen in your life. I know you have. But the good news is if you get knocked down, I pray like Les Brown said, you land on your back because if you can look up, you can get up. Life is coming by. Matter of fact, watch this. The struggles have made me stronger than the person I was yesterday. Man, I feel excited to know that I can overcome. I'm excited to know that when the storms of life come, man, that I can pull inside myself. I have a network of people that love me, people that support me, and I believe in myself. And finally, <laughs> boy, if I didn't screw this one up, he said, uh, Sometimes when people get divorced, depending upon how they get divorced, it really causes them a lot of struggles in life. And that 2007 time frame that I was telling you about, well, what I didn't tell you was I had all three of those things happen to me in that, in that one year. My mom passed, I was hospitalized, and I got divorced. So, But you know, I look back and I say, what did I learn from that? I learned how to be a better man. I learned how to be a better father. I learned how to be a better leader. I learned how to have some compassion and empathy for a fellow man. I learned that everything can be taken away from me. I didn't need the pandemic to show me that. I knew that back in 2007. I also knew that there was a greater good that we had to do. And that's how people overcome the struggles of life. I tell you this today, not to lift myself up, but to show you that here's a gentleman, barely got through high school, no college degree. Yet I'm an adjunct professor now at some 25 colleges around the country where I nationally speak. And I don't say that to impress you. I say because Dr. Bruce believed in me and I worked on my gift. I worked on my gift. I developed my gift. I overcome some struggles of life. The next one, man, this is a tough one to talk about. Self-discipline. If I had only disciplined myself, where would I be? I don't live in a regret, but I look back and think that just the simple things. If I could have disciplined my mouth, because everything I'm thinking, I don't need to say. Because everything I have to say, everybody don't want to hear. If I had disciplined my emotions, if I had disciplined my thought process, if I had disciplined my actions, where would I be? If I had been more consistent. And that word has been a word that I keep across my office door, across my computer screens, in my bathroom as I look in the mirror every morning and just ask this question, are you disciplined? Because if you're not, you're going to be undisciplined and you don't want those consequences. So I finally, <laughs> through the COVID, I picked up some additional weight, you know, like the refrigerator just stood in my way. Every time I came past, I don't know why it reminded me of everything that was in there. And I had a habit, you know, just going to the refrigerator. So now the discipline of back to the gym, ah, oh, six o'clock in the morning, getting up to get to the gym to do 10 miles, man, that's just ridiculous. But it's the price you got to pay if you want to get to where you're going to be. At 60, I don't want to do that. We well, don't have to. You just live with what the consequences are. And so Dr. Bruce had a simple philosophy he shared with me. He said, if you discipline yourself, life becomes a lot more, a lot easier to deal with. And I asked you this question today. Don't, don't put it in the chat box. Just think about it. What's the one thing that you've been staring at in the face that you know you need the discipline and you've not done it? It's going to keep you right where you're at. And it's not going away. That giant only gets bigger. If you want to maximize your potential, you got to address these things head on, face to face, right now. Take action. The next area, boy, he was adamant about this one. This one, we spent a good 
three, four years on, talked about it every day we were together. He said, you must have a plan for your life. You must have goals. And I often would say, i got goals. They're all right here. He said, the problem with that is, until you write them down, you don't believe them. And I often questioned that and said, but, but I, can, I got them right here. He said, but we have to see it before we believe it. Because whatever the mind can see and believe, it can also achieve. So you can't see it that's in your head. He said, and besides, when you write it down on paper, you're not writing on paper. You're writing in your subconscious mind what will be for the rest of your life. He said, you must have a well-defined goal-setting plan. He said, you must be the architect of your own life. He said, you must be able to look back and account for your 168 hours every week. Man, he was unbelievable. He would say this. A dream is when it's in your head. A goal is when it's on paper with a well-defined plan. He said it must have a date. It must have some action items, some tactical approaches. And this, don't miss this. He said, here's the key that must be present in every goal-setting plan that will move you from point A to point B when you don't feel like it. He said it must have a pain statement attached to it. And I thought, now, why would I use a pain statement to motivate myself? And then I began to just realize, my whole life I've been pain motivated. My whole life I've been pain driven. I don't want to go back to where I was, so I work harder today. I don't want to experience what I used to do in life, so I stay away from those things. I stay focused over here, and I don't go over here because I know what this is going to cause. So that's a form of pain motivation. He said, write down a statement. So I remember when my mother died of a massive heart attack and my father died of a stroke. And I remember going to the doctor and at that point, man, it was like my cholesterol was through the roof. And he began to tell me about my mother and my father. And he said, you know, Mel, if you keep it up. And boy, I got to tell you, he really scared me that day. He used pain to motivate me. So I came home. And I wrote this across the refrigerator. Now, this may be too much for you, but I'm just telling you what I do because I know what motivates me. I wrote this across the refrigerator. Go ahead, eat it. If you have to eat it, go ahead, eat it. But are you prepared for the consequences that come behind what you're eating? Man, I changed my diet and I, I just... I use pain to motivate because I'm a pain-based person that understands pain is a great motivator. Pain can be a motivator, not a jailer. It can motivate you to success. He said you have to have an ultimate goal. And I said, Dr. Bruce, an ultimate goal? What is that? He said, on the last day when they put you in the ground, what will they say? And I thought, wow, that's pretty powerful. Am I writing my eulogy? I asked him. He said, no. What will the people around you say? Forget what's in the eulogy. He said, you must have. So I wrote one. Here it is. On the last day when they put me in the ground, had them say something other than he was a nice guy. My goal is to leave this world to better places as a result of my being. The positive impact upon the thousands of people's lives that I'm going to encounter while on this earth for such a short period of time. And on the last day, yes, when they put me in the ground, had them say something other than he was a nice guy and leave that legacy and platform that my family can build upon. Because all I want to do is what Dr. Bruce taught me. Leave the world a better place. That's my ultimate goal. So that's my mission statement. So as long as I know that, I know where I'm going. That's the end. Stephen Covey said, start with the end in mind. That's the end. That's what I want. More than anything. I have some spiritual things I want further than that, but I'm talking about while on this earth. And so he said, you must have a five-year, a two-year, one-year. And it became real difficult for me to have one, two, three, five-year goals. He said, well, i got a challenge for you. I need you to set 30-day goals and let's measure them at the end of every 30 days and see if you've got them. Because if you can do it for 30 days, you can do it 12 times and that's a year. He made it very simple for me. And so today, at 60 years old, I set 30-day goals. I know I can run and sprint hard for 30 days. And at the end of 30 days, I start all over again. And I only measure and monitor my activity. Not what I said I was going to do, but what I actually did. I use my calendar as my resource and my desk pad where I write all my notes and I measure my activity. 87% of the population don't have a well-defined goal-setting plan that I just described. 
Folks, it's imperative. If you're going to achieve great things in life, if you're going to maximize your potential, you must have goals that are well-defined, written down with a goal-setting plan and structure. Let me help you with that if I can. Yes, that last part of the seven that we're going to cover today is attitude. You know, great people don't get caught up in trivial things. Great people aren't gossipers. We don't tear people down. We don't go, we don't take your baggage and bring it on to us. We try to help you with your baggage. And we try to understand that our attitude is the cornerstone of everything we do. How we see the world through the lens upon which we walk every day. So I just want to ask you, could your attitude use maybe a little adjustment? Could, could you just use maybe a little overhaul in your attitude? Maybe your attitude's working real well and you're streamlining it and you're getting better. Maybe you need a daily a system to reinforce your attitude. Maybe getting up reading in the morning. Maybe walking in the morning. Maybe spending some time in meditation. Build the mind of these, of these 24 hours in a day. How much time are we spending building this thing that changes this? So watch, watch, watch. Dr. Bruce said, read, read. And read, Milton, but be careful what you read. He said, because what goes in here comes out here. What goes in here changes the way this thinks. What goes in here affects how this operates. He was very clear that I had to read to change my attitude. Because I thought the world worked a completely different way than the way I discovered that it actually worked. I didn't realize that I was my own worst enemy. I didn't realize that everything I wanted in life was right in front of me if I was willing to take action, take the risk, and move beyond my comfort zones and change my attitude. The greatest thing in life we can do is change our own attitude and watch our family members change. Watch our coworkers change. Watch our community change. Watch the world change. All because somebody decided to change their attitude. So as we talk about maximizing your potential and understanding your value, these next few slides are really just to bring awareness to some things. You probably know it, but I hope this is a refresh for you. The first thing I want to tell you is you're more than the job description and the title that you hold. I work with some groups here in, in Maryland, and some of them play football on Sundays, and they weigh purple. And matter of fact, you may have seen them on TV, and I work with them. And I don't teach them how to catch balls. I help them with their thought process. And one of them was a very young man who was catching footballs on a Sunday and returning punts and actually won a Super Bowl that he got hurt and was no longer able to be on the team. He watched his superstardom go from sports center to no center. And his whole life, he saw crashing down because his sense of worth was tied to what he did for a living and not who he was. Because you're more than HR directors. Your mothers, your fathers, your brothers, your sisters, your community leaders. But when you get tied up into the title that you are, watch this. What happens when they take that title? Do they take your value? Do they take your worth? Absolutely not. Use your position to influence and to help people. Use your value to move people and to do great things. And so don't get confused with your value as it relates to a position or a title. The next thing that really speaks volumes is our ability to work well with others. Because this is, this is the greatest thing. This is the greatest thing that we can do is influence people. Don't miss this. Influence people, not convince them. I'm not in the business of convincing people. If you convince them, Ken, you got to do it over and over and over and over. I'm in the business of influencing, where you now have ownership of the thought process, of the process, of the job, of the task, of the project. Now it's yours. Take ownership. So in teamwork, we find ourselves, first of all, trying to have teamwork when we don't even understand if we have team players. So the greatest value you can be is be the best team player you can be and put in the most work you can so we can work together. 
The challenge lies is when we come together and someone doesn't quite have the same value and belief system that you have as it relates to work. My mother said, I'd rather that you wear out than rust out. 38 days she worked at 38 years she worked at the same company, London Fog Manufacturing Company, making these gorgeous London Fog coats, only missing three days in 38 years. What did you think my belief system was around work? You got it. You're not gonna outwork me. You may be smart than me, but you're not gonna outwork me because when you're asleep, I'm working. When you're not thinking, I'm thinking. Because I know this. The greatest thing I have is my ability to control how I work with others. Personal development, work on that so that you can be a better team player. The next thing that's critical if we want to maximize our potential and bring value is increase our knowledge. Now let me take you through this progression of knowledge. One of the greatest myths, and Dr. Bruce would share this with me all the time, knowledge is not power. The application of knowledge is power. I need you to get some specific knowledge in a specific area and apply it immediately to see results. All too often, we're entangled in general knowledge. General knowledge is great if that serves you. But I need specific knowledge to move the needle, to move the agenda, to move the cause, to move the purpose. I need knowledge. The next thing is critical to all success is you must stay relevant. The opposite of being relevant is irrelevant. Nobody wants to be irrelevant. We want to be relevant. You stay relevant by what you put in here. You stay relevant by what goes in here. You stay relevant by your association. You stay relevant by who are you inspiring and influencing. Man, it's a great thing when you're relevant and people know it. It's a terrible thing when you think you're relevant, but you're really irrelevant. Oh, that one hurts. So that's my value proposition for you. 